Thank you, Patrick, for that gracious invitation. And thank you to our hosts here at George Mason University. It is an, a real honor to be here. And as Patrick mentioned, I think it's, it's appropriate that Tom was going to be here and that he's saying farewell to a great communicator and a friend. I, I, it taught me a great lesson as I've listened to people speak of Frank and speak of what it means to be part of a cadre of a family of communicators. If you're a communicator, if you think you're one, I think everyone actually is one, whether or not they realize it, but communicators are special people and they indeed are a family. My family is looking at any minute now to welcome a new baby into the world. And so this coincidence of events today for me has said, let's communicate for some good purposes. Let's talk about how and why we communicate. And in the case of the United Nations Foundation, we believe that whatever you communicate, you have the capability of doing so for a better world. That's why you're here. And I hope that what we'll do over the next few minutes and until they tell me to get off this stage, what I hope I can do, knowing what I know about George Mason, is let's challenge each other with some ideas. You are people who are ready, who have already started making your mark on the world. A number of you, I had a chance to meet with a couple of you, and I know that you're looking at your career. And I know that what's most helpful when you're starting, when you're looking, when you're making your way into the workforce, is to be aware of the big talking points, not just about you, but about the world in which you live. So with your permission, what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is talk about how the world in which you're going to live, the world of communications, is a world in which, as you can see, everything has changed. So I'm going to go over some basics. And I hope that over the course of the next few minutes, you're going to leave with some talking points where whether it's in your next interview, whether it's in your networking session, whether you're talking to someone at the cocktail party or on Skype or with friends about what you're going to do with this great career of yours, you can have the talking points about why everything has changed. And that's a good thing. Everything has changed because I wanted to show you a gift here that for me is the ultimate metaphor of how everything has changed. This was my TV growing up on Milan Avenue in Pasadena, California. A couple of you recognized it. I saw you, I'm not gonna out you, but a couple of you recognized it as your television. I was amazed by this Zenith. By the way, I haven't met any executives from Zenith Corporation. I apologize if anything I will say will be perceived as inflammatory, but wow, the Zenith television. I think it probably had about as much technical capability as a Casio calculator, but it amazed me because the Zenith television had 13 things down here. There were 13 options on that dial. Some of you are nodding your head. Some of you have the zenith. 13 abilities for me to have something delivered to me. It amazed me. And by the way, I still have no idea what that dial on the top did. But there were 64 amazing options of just blur or haze. But the zenith television had 13 things that could happen to me. And I had the ability to choose what they were. That was the zenith television not so long ago. I'm not about to graduate from university. I'm not at the point in, in your careers that some of, in which some of you find yourselves, but the people that you're going to be talking to and networking with, they all grew up with pretty much the Zenith TV. But this is the TV in my house today. Now, maybe it not, might not be the largest. I don't have people coming to my place to watch the Super Bowl and to watch, to watch great things, but it's a pretty good TV. Now, my reaction to the Zenith and you know this, but let's get the talking points down. My reaction to the Zenith was 13 things can happen to me. My little daughter, Eliza, she's about to be five, she's hilarious. When Eliza walks up to our TV, what is her reaction? She doesn't see 13 options. Do you know what she does to that TV? If you're a parent, you may know. She walks up to that TV and goes like this. Because Eliza Rose, my little girl, she's not waiting for 13 things to happen to her. She's going like this to that screen, and she's speaking to it in Spanish, and she's saying, donde esta Dora? <laughs> because she believes that she will tell that screen, that technology, what she wants it to do and in which language. And while Eliza Rose is the example of a suburban kid here outside of DC, everything has changed, and that symbol is a symbol in which we find ourselves in that rapidly changing world. And Eliza Rose is gonna work for one of you. You're gonna try to get a job with one of us, and you're going to have people who are going to work for you who immediately saw technology as something that says, I'm going to divert you, I'm going to utilize you, I'm going to interact with you, and it's probably going to be in another language. So the fact that everything has changed, I've started out with these metaphors about technology, and it's great, and that's probably absorbed a lot of your class time and a lot of the, the in-services that you've had and some of the, the, the uh, programs that you've had here at George Mason. But at the heart of it, it's more than just gadgetry, and I'm not going to talk to you today 
about something that might happen in Silicon Valley or the latest gadgetry from Wired. I'm not going to discuss some of the new whiz-bang things that might come out of a trade show. I'd like to challenge us to think about how this is really about more than technology. It's really about a new method of communicating brought on by this new technology. You know this. Maybe instinctively you know it. Maybe you know it because you've practiced it. Maybe you know it because you've studied it. But let's get the talking points down so that when you're networking, when you're having those career building moments, you're able to articulate the context about why everything has changed. We at the UN Foundation love to connect people and ideas. And so we have to have these talking points down. We believe that everyone, regardless of what they do, is living in a moment where this evolution in the digital space, this digital evolution, is causing, in the space in which we work, a philanthro revolution. And we'll unpack that in the next couple of minutes. We'll talk about what a philanthro revolution looks like and why it's enabling people in any line of business to do good while they're doing well and to make sure that those who are doing well have doing good at the heart of it. We think we're learning something about how the digital tools, the digital evolution, means the philanthro revolution is probably at the core of your career evolution. Those for us are symbolized by a couple of phrases, and I'm going to share them with you right now. Again, these are phrases where when we talk with people who are interested in big global issues, but they don't know how to connect. People who want to know more about the United Nations, but they don't know how to connect. There are seven phrases that, for me, have started to symbolize what is possible when we harness the evolution in digital with the revolution in philanthropy. This, for me, says that everything that we thought we knew about philanthropy and advocacy and public relations and brands means that communication is an entirely different practice. Now, your professors are talking to you about the absolute must-know, must-have uh, uh, areas and theses in this, area, in, in, in this sector, but we think that you have something to teach the rest of the world. I'm going to keep talking if we can hear me. I'm just going to speak loudly. Okay, good. The first phrase, which for me is probably the most utilized but least understood, is the phrase that everyone is connected. You like to throw it out there. People who manage communications departments, PR firms large and small, love to bank on the fact that everyone is connected. That is a given for most of you in the room. But you need to remember, as you go out into the workplace, that just because everyone is connected, every one of the symbols, every one of the brands up here on this slide is brand spanking new to the world. The majority of them did not exist 15 years ago. They would have looked at them and seen a letter, a bunch of people, and a bird. And that was pretty much it. But for an emerging constituency, an exciting cadre of communicators, you know instinctively not only what the brand represents in terms of technology, but the way in which it communicates. That's a basic, but my job today is to give you the talking point to remember the context of the working environment in which you go. 15 years ago, people would have seen a W and an F and a bird. So everyone is connected, but that is not a foregone conclusion for everybody. And there will be those people, and I've met those people, I work with those people who say, social, schmoshal, digital, this is a passing fad, who knows how long this thing is going to last, youngsters these days, everything's a fad. That's not the case, because the world is social. You know this because you live it, but let's have some talking points and let's share some talking points together. The world is such a social place, in fact, that we have the data right now that shows that among internet users who check in daily on a social platform, the world pretty much looks like this. Is that a fad? Is that something that's going to go away? That is a new way of people's ability to look at the world. It's a new approach to world communications. The pace at which this has happened is staggering. You may know it, but I want you to have the talking point. It took three years, two months, and a day to get to that billionth tweet. Now, there was a new platform. There was a platform that was building a constituency and a community. And when Twitter was a new thing, it took this long to get to a billion tweets. Any ramp up, any startup, any new technology is going to take a long time to build, right? But what does it mean to be at scale? I'm talking about Twitter right now, but you know that this is the case for any social media platform approach that we're talking about because today it takes one week to produce that amount of tweets. So they were in startup phase, granted. People were understanding how to use it. People were subscribing. People were starting to utilize it. But today, we're there. 
So I think for someone in your stage of your career, it's not helpful to be defensive, but it's super helpful to have the talking point about just how social that world is. Do you remember that map? That map for me says a couple of really important things. One of the key things it says to me is while we might have Silicon Valley here in this country, while Silicon Beltway might be a thing that we all live in here in the DC area, while Silicon Alley might exist in Manhattan, we are not the most social animals among internet users on a daily basis. I love this map because it immediately asks questions about India. And if you're looking at this map, you realize whether or not you're interested in the country, you had better understand how people communicate in Brazil. If you understand scale, if you understand how everything has changed, these people are going to be determining how we communicate as a, as a neighborhood community. Now I'm going to tell you some things about some generations. There are those who say it's not helpful to label a generation, but your bosses are going to grapple with it. The people making investment decisions are grappling with it. Politicians have no idea sometimes what to do with it. But the reality is you have a relationship, and you have a relationship with your phone. I don't know how it's going. It's not my business to get into, it's not my business to get into your relationship, but I know a couple of things about you and your phone. And we use this hopefully evocative picture of a young lady resting with her phone because that just happens to be the case. Our day starts and ends with technology. That was not always the case, and this is how it's going to evolve. The stats that we're sharing today are some that may hit home for some of you. So 79% of people within 15 minutes of waking grab the phone, 62% immediately after waking, and for some people, there's not even a moment because it is the alarm clock. So the first thing that you touch may not be the person in your bed, it may not be anything else in your bedroom, it's going to be a piece of technology. You know it. You're nodding, you understand it, but it was not the case 15 years ago. Entering into a workplace, these are the, this is the context, this is the reality, this is why everything has changed. Now, ages 18 to 24, the numbers are different. According to a study from Media Bistro, this is what we go to because we know what we can do, we know what we depend on, we know what's available with that technology. And it has freaked out people in cities of power. People are trying to understand what to do when what you're brandishing today is not something that will take hours or minutes or maybe a fax to get to a world leader. The same technology with which you will talk to Washington, D.C., or the same technology that can rally people in Tower Square, or the same technology that can transform a plaza in Hong Kong and the political rhetoric in Hong Kong is the technology that you touch first thing in the morning. And I don't think those stats are going to get any lower. I think they're going to get higher. So you as a communicator know this, but this is your talking point. It's nothing to be defensive about. It's nothing you have to prove. It's something that you need to reiterate and something that you can leverage. The everything has changed moment for me of the last year that was perhaps the most telling was the remarkable difference between what happened in Via della Concordanza, I believe that's the name, in Rome, Italy, between the penultimate and this most recent papal election. I loved this picture. Did you see this? This is the V. It's a beautiful street if you've ever been there. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very large boulevard in the center of, of, of Rome leading up to, to, to the Vatican. And this was the picture when the penultimate pope was elected. People waiting, people ready. And this was this time around. So Pope Francis' election, waiting for white smoke, happened with devices in hand. How remarkable is this? And what does it do to an institution an institution that for some people may seem far away, a religion, a political body, something that is grand and august, like the United Nations, something that we think about all day, like a university. But that brand is now in the hands of the people who wake up with it and who are going to transmit it immediately. I love the image. I love the image of St. Peter's in the hand of someone in the moment, broadcasting something that matters to their faith something that matters to their passion, because that's what you're going to be able to do as you enter into the marketplace. The second phrase that is maybe overused but not well understood is this idea about we have global reach. We hear it all the time at the UN Foundation. We hear it from organizations. We hear it from people who want to partner with us. We hear this phrase all the time from groups who love to galvanize and build communities. And we have global reach used to mean this. It used to mean I have the ability to get on a plane and I have a branch office in Cape Town. It used to mean I have the ability to get to Beijing, or I was there last year. 
That's what global reach used to mean. And this was the map that for many people, and we pulled a stock photo of how many in the public relations industry liked to talk about we have global reach. I can get there. I got a guy in this city. There's a woman I work with that's my affiliate here. But this is the map that most fascinates me. This was taken from an event, I think two or, or maybe even three years ago at this point. This is the map that for many people looks like a world map, and it's not, maybe you've seen it. This maps a Twitter chat about women's reproductive health, and it organizes the world based on traffic and discussion and conversation for women's reproductive health. And what you're not seeing is not about continents. What you're seeing are nodes of conversation. The world that we want to map out right now used to look like this and was divided by continents and geographies and, and divided by oceans. And today that world is connected and coalesces around conversation. You've studied these. You know about them. Maybe you use them. Maybe you've got the analytics in whatever project you're working on. But 15 years ago, this was something that the communications industry would have paid a lot of money to guess at. There were some Nielsen ratings involved. There was a lot of focus grouping. There was some testing. But it was always an approximation of a real-time conversation. But here, this is the snapshot of the real-time conversation. So where those birds that a couple of years ago would have looked like a bird now mean conversation, now mean community. And in the case of the World Cup, and I believe this was the final match for the World Cup this year, we now have the ability to map intensity of conversation. How exciting is this? You know it instinctively, but 15 years ago, it was something that we had to approximate. Now it's something that the Cracker Jack digital team that I had the chance to work with can pull up immediately. This is what it looked like when you've got 100,000 tweets per minute happening about a game, linked by broadcast television and the internet, and definitely linked by social media. People who are broadcasting for themselves on behalf of themselves. Do you remember that map that we showed you earlier? Where and what country was the 74% relevant? Does anyone remember? Who was it? Come on, someone tell me. It was the US. Who said it? Raise your hand. Be proud. Who said 70? Who said US? Thank you. OK, because we're going to get to you in a minute. 74% in the US, internet users check in on a daily basis on a social platform in this proportion. This is a great world in which to be a communicator. It scares some people to death because it means they've lost the power, but it means we know where to find the power, and that means that the bigger issues can have the broadest impact when we embrace the fact that people are their broadcast channel. People are able to talk about, are able to celebrate what matters the most to them. People are the future of public relations, but you know what? They always have been. What we have right now is some technology that allows us to communicate in newer ways, bigger ways, and, uh, and allow us to do it at scale. I love it when people say, today, thanks to digital technology and this digital evolution, I know what people are saying. Again, for many of us who've been working on communications, we've been mapping for a long time. We've mapped for years, and we've loved to guess, and we've loved to approximate, and focus grouping is fascinating. There's nothing better than listening to people and drawing out insights nuance from what's going on. But it was really tough, and it was a Madison Avenue guess to know exactly what people were talking about in a way that was credible and statistically relevant. Now, this might not pass a statistics course, the things that I'm about to show you, but when I was preparing to come here, I wanted to know what people were talking about at Fairfax. And last Tuesday, this is precisely what was going on in Fairfax among social, social chatter. This is what people were talking about in this fine city in which we are here. Now, by the way, this was not my guess. This was based on a sample and a set that is statistically significant because it's pretty much all of you. And this is what people were talking about in Fairfax. But the reality is I could immediately know what was happening in Philadelphia. I didn't have to stop there. I didn't have to spend years on that. And Fargo, this is what they were talking about there. And this alliteration will continue for a few moments, sorry, because in Fortaleza, this was the conversation at the same minute and here we are in Florence and Fairbanks. So let's do a quick study. Let's do a quick, uh, quick question to the group. I want you to look at it for a few moments. And Bryce, I'm going to look to you for a second if we have one of those. Oh, I have them behind me here? Great. So I'd like you to tell me, what is it from, I'm going to review for one second, from Fairfax, take a moment, to Philadelphia, to Fargo, to Fortaleza, to Florence, to Fairbanks? What do all of these conversations have in common? 
What amazing insight are we about to find when we compare what happened one week ago, one week ago today, in all of these cities around the world? Not a guess, not a hunch. Data showing what social chatter was about. What do people love to talk about? Ma'am. People adore talking about themselves. Who are you? Aaron. Aaron. Oh, I love your name. Come up here, Aaron. Okay, Aaron's going to get the first swag bag. So here she goes, because she was, she was brave enough to, to, to say the great truth. Aaron, are you, are you a student? Yes. Thank you. This is your United, Foundation, United Nations Foundation swag bag. Thank you. People adore. Can we give some love to Aaron, please, by the way? She deserves some love. Courageous soul. People adore talking about themselves. We knew that before, but now we can actually find out exactly how they love to talk about themselves. What else, though? You're all geniuses here at George Mason. What else do people love to talk about themselves? They adore talking about themselves. What else? Yes. They love to talk about other people where? I'm sorry, near them, exactly. People love to talk about their own community. Now, we talked about how global issues and big ideas and big, big grand news is still accessible, but people love to talk about themselves. They love to talk about people that are near them. What else is a common theme through these, through these words? There's something else that's in there that's weird. People in every city love to talk about a particular thing. They love to talk about themselves. They love to talk about people who are near them, things that are happening in their community. Is there anything else in there that's interesting to you? What else do people like to talk about? Everybody, ma'am. I'm sorry? Everyone loves to talk about what's happening at their government level. So big government dominates the headlines, and people love to talk about what's happening at their local level, whether it's the, whether it's the city level, whether it's the municipality, whether it's the county. People adore to talk about what's happening in their government structure. So that means with more access to this data, with more information, we are now in an era where governments and people who do this work are committed to, by you, we're committed by social to more transparency. This is the era in which we live. I love the phrase that says we support the good guys. This idea that each of us is about the good guys. So as you go into the workforce, we want you to have this phrase solidly behind you. What does it mean to support the good guys? Brought with me an image, a very privileged image of a particular place in Kansas. Do you recognize the place? Where are we? Come on, where are we? We're at the salad dressing aisle. Someone said Walmart, maybe, I don't know. We're at a, we're at a salad dressing aisle and the salad dressing aisle says a lot about you as a generation, a lot about the new context of public relations and communications. The salad dressing aisle is an amazing place because that same 15 years ago, people were buying things based on what? We all know what the basics are. They based on, bought based on price, based on look, sometimes based on where it lands on the shelf. And then all of a sudden, a salad dressing comes on the market and blows everything up. What is it? Paul Newman comes around. Do any of you buy Paul Newman salad dressing? You're nodding your head because you know why Paul Newman salad dressing blew everything up. Was it a different price point? No. Amazing new packaging? No. Phenomenal marketing placement? No. But it had cause next to it. And this is a phenomenon that we now can track, and a phenomenon that is yours to go into the workplace and own and excel. We know that 64% of consumers are purchasing based on social content, and they want purpose. We know that 91% of millennials are using social media to talk about their brands today, and they want purpose. In fact, seven out of 10 will say that they want purpose to be part of their career. They might want to be part of a large corporation, a small startup, but either way, seven out of 10 will say, I want purpose to be part of my career. And they're social, and they're talking about a brand, and that's why salad dressing matters because you have the power to change the way that we market to one another. You have the power to change the way that people produce products. You have the power to change the way that people combine something happening inside of their soul and what they're doing at the salad dressing aisle in Walmart in Kansas. And social media has allowed us to track it in real time. People were always doing good. There were great brands in America and around the world that were always doing good but the ante has been upped. The game is on, and the stakes are high, and big brands are catching on. Big brands are catching on because people like you are saying it matters. That 70% of millennials who want to work for a place with purpose say that they want to use their skills to benefit a good cause, not as a big cat philanthropist when they've hit it big, but starting from day one in the door. Do you recognize that in yourself? 
I have to recognize it every time I have a job interview. Every time there's an applicant on the other side of a table from me, I have to recognize that they want to use their skills for good starting from today, not as an afterthought. I'm going to skip ahead for a couple of seconds on, uh, on how this, this means that we, as people who interact with others, have all become ambassadors for causes and products. We at the UN Foundation love this moment. We love the fact that people identify themselves as an ambassador for a cause while identifying themselves as an ambassador for an issue. Everyone says this phrase. Everyone says we should be focused on young people. Young people are where the market is. Young people are where the money is. But at the UN Foundation, we believe that young people are where the moment is. This is the stat. How many people are in our world? Seven billion people entered into this world when a little baby was born a couple of years ago in the Philippines. Cute little girl that was named Baby Seven Billion. Do you remember this? Lots of, lots of amazing rhetoric, incredible reportage on how seven billion people in the world will change the way that we interact with each other. That was reported on, but the demographic, and I'm not a demographer, but the demographic that we think should be on the tip of the tongue of the George Mason student, the tip of the tongue of the communicator who's looking around the corner, who's looking at the next big thing, should be this one. The world's never been bigger, yeah, we got it, but the world has never been younger. 43% of that seven billion is under the age of 25. And if you've been listening for the last few minutes, you know a couple of things about them. They're social, they're talking about a brand, they want a brand to be a part of what they buy, and they will work for an organization or expect to work for an organization that has purpose as part of what they do. Big things like disease, human rights, making sure that women and girls are empowered. That's what we know about this 43%. So the world's never been bigger, and that crazy big world is a world where 43% of people are under the age of 25. Now, for the UN Foundation, this, this uh, signifies a bit of a challenge. This is a challenge for us because we want everyone in the same room. We don't want young people to feel like they've been isolated into one area or where they can only operate in a, in a particular conversation. We believe that we've got to find messaging, and some of my colleagues will tell you about this later. We need to find messaging that brings everyone into the same table because everyone today has a global view and global reach. I'm going to share with you, I'm going to do a quick time check. Are we doing okay on time? All right. I'm going to show you a video that we at the foundation uh, produced in partnership with some friends, and this was a, a micro campaign that was based on some data we were seeing on social about how people viewed themselves relative to the bigger world. Let me show you a little bit about what we learned from the global <laughs> given moment, we are connected by our love of life and our ability to make a difference. Join us. So an organization like ours, living in a seven billion person world, has a challenge. Because the people who care about global issues, those are the policy wonks, right? 
Those are the nerdy people that do nothing but read the post all day and go to panel discussion to panel discussion, sometimes are on the panel, sometimes they're listening to the panel. But no, you saw some people in that video. Did you see yourself in the video? I have a couple of favorites. I really love Claire. I love the woman who identifies herself as a fashionista and a barista, and by the way, is really into climate change. She's my favorite. There's a couple of people in the, the NASCAR guy is fascinating. Someone who said, it's okay for me to be both at the same time. I can be bilingual when it comes to big issues, intense on policy, I want to be identified with a big world, and by the way, I'm okay with those things living together. This is not going to be the policy me, or the big thinking IR, international relations expert me, and then there's the rest of me. What we're hearing on social media, what we're hearing from this new tool, is that people are very comfortable with that. And the last line that for us at the UN Foundation, as a communications exercise, was a risk. How do you boil down wanting to be in a seven billion person world and make it relevant for people without dumbing it down? And that's what we know from Fortaleza to Fairbanks to Fairfax. Everybody loves their life. Everyone wants to make a difference and they see the connection between their local world and they see the connection between the broader world. That's a communications basic, that hasn't changed, but the technology and the digital evolution means we can articulate it better with so much data. It is a great time to be communicating in a very global world. That for us, and I'll speak for a moment in the sector that most touches home for us, the, the phrase that I love to hear is that philanthropy is changing. Oh, philanthropy is changing. And what you just saw means that philanthropy will never be the same. We know that people love to tell their own story. Storytelling is a buzzword in any of your public relations classes, in a communications course, and in any PR firm from K Street to Madison Avenue, everyone is gonna talk about the importance of letting people tell their own story. There's an experiment that we wanna tell you about here at George Mason, where we think the time is right to let storytelling and philanthropy collide in a beautiful way, and that's been this experiment of Giving Tuesday. I'm gonna do a quick straw poll. How many of you have ever heard of Giving Tuesday? I hope there's at least three people in the room. Oh, that's so great. And even if it's a lie, I'm gonna take it because it makes me feel happy. Giving Tuesday was an experiment because in our world and viewing how this world exists and with some brilliant minds at partner organizations like the 92nd Street Y and a Black Bod and a number of organizations who came together, they called up and talked to my boss at the UN Foundation and said, you know, we've got a day for getting deals and we've got a day called Cyber Monday. Why isn't there a day for celebrating giving? And what if we let other people say how they can be a fashionista, a barista, and a philanthropista? What if we give you the day to be all three things? What if we take back the word philanthropist from the big cat that gave the big check to the $10 donor, to the person who wants to send a net to save a life in the fight against malaria, or help a girl get to school, or help an animal shelter down the street. What if we experimented with that? And we know now that people want to tell their own story. We know this because we live in the era where last year's selfie finally was inducted into the dictionary. We love saying what we look like. We love chronicling who we are in real time. We have that power in our hands. We've already discussed that during this session this morning. But what if instead of all of this, and there's a woman here that you're gonna hear from later who helped develop this concept, what if we went from the selfie where we don't always look so great we look really self-absorbed. Sometimes we just should have thought twice before posting. But what if we allowed people to be unselfy about it? And Giving Tuesday, the day after Cyber Monday, allowed for people to celebrate the unselfy side of them. What does it mean to be unselfy? What does it mean to celebrate a cause next to me? Where, and some of you who've been in the business for a long enough time will know, 20 years ago would have seemed like bragging. It would be so braggadocious to talk about what you give your small check to, or your small or large donation to, unless you really want the name on the side of the building, or unless you're a benefactor. But today's world says, I feel very comfortable doing both. I feel very comfortable with my identity as a philanthropist, doing good in the world and being who I am. And I might not be the fat cat with the big check, but I'm gonna make a big difference because I've got a big voice and I got a phone. So Giving Tuesday is that experiment. And I'm gonna send around, we're not gonna have a chance to see it now, but I'm gonna send around via my Twitter feed a link to a video about Giving Tuesday, and we invite you to get involved with Giving Tuesday and celebrate your giving as part of this community. But this idea that we want to tell our own story was an important lesson for us at the UN Foundation, and Giving Tuesday allowed all of us to put that story to the test. 
I'm going to talk about that for a moment because given some of the feedback I got from some of you in conversations this morning, I'd like to experiment a little more with what it means, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about storytelling, and how in a world with social media, in a world with social media at our fingertips, how maybe instead of storytelling, what we're actually doing today as public relations experts, as communicators, as people who wanted to have a great career, that we're actually storifying. And here's where things will get uncomfortable for a second. It's not about collecting stories. It's about allowing people to tell their stories. It's about, it's about us being able to curate people's story in a way that's authentic, and in a world where a lot of things coexist. These are the pictures of some very happy moms with some very happy babies that are a very real part of a campaign that the UN Foundation works on in children's health. It's called the Shot at Life campaign. We love it. We love working with top online moms. We love them telling their stories about how they want a healthy world for their baby. But because everyone is watching what everyone does in public, we all know that this reality exists today. Happy moms, happy babies, children's health. But we also know that this is the reality of the discussion around health today. This is the reality of a world that's grappling with Ebola. These two images are entering your phone that you grabbed first thing out of bed. These images are the same images, and you're going to get them simultaneously. And your Instagram feed is not going to level you into it little by little. Your Instagram feed is not going to tell you you can come into this until you're ready to get the Ebola stuff. We'll start with the, the soft stuff and then go hard. No. Social media has said, you are able now, you have an acumen for toggling between really hefty, really big, sometimes very scary issues, and the aspirations and the very real feelings that are part of what you want to be in your life. So these two images, as disparate as they can seem, need to be storified and curated in a way that is authentic so that we're not being disrespectful to people who are having one of the challenges versus another, and while we're not saying that your reality matters any less than the others. This is a communications challenge in which you find yourself. And whether you're on the side of the interview where you're looking for the job or giving the job, the technology has meant that the game is really tough. It's a challenge for a communicator. It's a challenge for anyone. And it's why this generation is an exciting one, because you're going to have the ability to do it. We learned this lesson, and I'll tell you a quick story about how it hit home at the UN Foundation. You remember the typhoon that devastated the Philippines a few years ago? We at the UN Foundation were working last year with a man by the name of Pharrell. You ever heard of him? You know who he is. And he had a little song. And Pharrell is a remarkable person, and he wanted to celebrate through something called the International Day of Happiness, a day around the song. It was a great idea. It was a remarkable idea. And he actually was ready to give away the song in a way that people could take it and make it their own. And we at the UN Foundation loved it. My colleague Zane, whom you're going to meet, helped us spearhead this process. And, and we loved seeing what was happening around a song that was called, what was the song called, by the way? Do you remember? Happy, you all know what it's called. So what happens when a song called Happy comes out, and there's people around the world celebrating an international day of happiness, and there's a typhoon that just devastated significant portions of the world? We're preparing for something. We're in the office, and I get a call. And I share this, this story with the utmost of respect. I think this is an audience in which we can share it. We got a call saying, you need to be aware that there's going to be a release coming out of the Philippines about the International Day of Happiness from Tacloban, one of the places hardest hit about from the typhoon. You're a communicator. You understand crisis communications. You understand what we're really trying to do in being authentic and helping toggle between these two realities. We did not know what to expect. We did not have a lot of information. A couple of minutes later, what hit the wires was a release and a link from Tacloban and a statement, an important statement about storytelling in our era. Let's watch a little bit of it and find out what we learned about what it really means to move from storytelling to storifying. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here, you can take a break. I'm a hot air balloon that could go to space. With the air, like I don't care, baby, by the way. Okay. 
their message? When they were telling their own story, what was the message from Tacloban? You saw it in his t-shirt in the last frame. What was it? Never give up. Thank you. There's power in an era where everyone has their own broadcast medium next to their bed, when organizations and institutions, very large ones, like the United Nations, like the government of the United States of America, like George Mason University, allow people to tell their own story, and they try to curate it to the best of their ability in a way that connects what's local, what's urgent, and what's passionate in a person. That's why everything has changed. I show that entire video because I love the fact that you get an, an instant to connect with 37 people in the Philippines that you never saw on CNN, that you couldn't get from just reading the post. All of those things are important, but I got to be with 37 people in the Philippines who had chosen that they were gonna tell me their story. That's why philanthropy is changing. Philanthropy is changing because the cause just went from your brain to your heart in a very quick download. Philanthropy is changing because instead of the big cat with the big check, this is a philanthropist. She's 13. She's had the internet in her home from the moment she was born. And she doesn't know where Malawi is on a map, but she Skyped with people. That's how she knows where Malawi is. She has had a conversation with girls like her in Malawi. That's why this idea that change, not charity, is dominating the social media stream when people want to talk about cause. That's why when people want to talk about what is social good, it's impossible to extract how social media has a role in social good. This idea about social good for us means that everything has changed when we talk about a large institution like the United Nations, where people come together to discuss world problems. This is what people normally think of when they think of that meeting every year at the General Assembly. But this is what the General Assembly looked like this last year. It was a place where a few blocks up the street, hundreds of bloggers were reporting back in real time about a multilateral conversation. We love being part of this social good community and conversation, and we love that just a few weeks from now, when you're all getting ready to count down New Year's night, 2015 begins a year when the world is remaking its to-do list. Some of you have heard about the Millennium Development Goals. The world finally has a to-do list, and it went from the year 2000 to 2015. You're the generation that's gonna decide how we do for the next 15 years. You've got the tools, you've got the storytelling ability, you have the inclination, the desire, and the aspiration to make doing good a part of what you do, not once you've made it big, but while you're doing all of it. Those are big challenges and big opportunities, and at the UN Foundation, we believe and we celebrate you in this stage in your career, these basic truths, the fact that everything has changed, you are global, not because you can get on a plane, but because you can communicate in real time. The fact that you know what people are thinking and that that philanthropy will be social. We know you want to be on the right side, the side of the good guys. We know that you're going to choose salad dressing, not just by how it tastes or how much you can buy for a buck, but what it's going to do for the world. We know that you want to be authentic in telling that story. And we know that that's the reason you can change the world by 2030. Thank you for being part of that story. Thank you for being part of that challenge. Thank you.